Hi guys, uh, thank you for joining this webinar um, by UX Academy, which is an introduction to conversational design. Um, thank you for joining today. Uh, sorry, we kicked off one minute late. Um, we had a slight issue with the transmission to YouTube. Um, as you see, uh, my name is Naveed. I'm founder of UX Academy. Um, and with, we, with me, um, I have um, Kane, um, Adrian, and Christina. Um, right now, you can see Kane and myself. Um, and as we go through the uh, presentation, we will, um, you'll see um, my colleagues and um, Christina, who's the other trainer as well. Um, so before we head off into the most interesting part of the, um, sh of the webinar, where you'll get to learn more about conversational design, I just wanted to very briefly go into who UX Academy is. So uh, first thing is, um, we've been around for over two years. Um, we actually spun off from another company called Mobile UX London. Uh, Mobile UX London is um, and has been going on for five years. And we and Mobile UX London provides events, runs events, or has been running events. Now it's online. Um, and we run an annual conference for UX design and product people. Um, and UX Academy came from that company. UX Academy is a standalone company which has been around for two years and has been training people from a range of different organizations. As you can see, uh, small to large companies such as Microsoft, Deloitte, um, Canon, Sainsbury's, Amazon, BT, um, a good list of, of who's who's, um, both running beginner courses, intermediate courses. Um, we're also introducing a product design course, service design course, um, but the most important topic for today is the uh, conversational design course. So yeah, so why join UX Academy? There's a lot of training out there. Um, we had this desire to provide um, practical courses um, in small classes, um, which have hands-on teaching. Um, admittedly, that started off being um, in person, um, but the way we are at the moment, obviously, we've, we've pivoted to moving online, and we've already did successfully delivered our first course online, which is a beginner US, UX course. And the conversational design will be the second online course, so we have some experience of running courses online, um, and the feedback has been very positive. Um, so as you can see, we will have very small class sizes of um, 15 people. Um, we will be running um, the course over six weeks. Um, everyone gets um, to work on a project um, and you have um, some fantastic teachers and two of those teachers you'll meet today. So yeah, so you're wondering who is um, who can get involved in the conversational design course? Well, it's been designed for people from all backgrounds. So yes, if you're a UX designer, it helps, um, but it's really been designed for people um, who aren't UX designers. Um, perhaps you come from a product design background, perhaps you come from a digital background or um, project management or business analyst, um, or you're someone in the commercial side and you wanna get more hands-on. And you know, it can, it, this kind of course appeals to people that wanna build their own skill, people that wanna add this very important topic to their um, portfolio, or people that want to skill themselves up internally um, within their organization. Um, yeah, we won't, we won't stick on this, but you can go to our website, myuxacademy.com, um, and you get to learn a lot about what people say um, and what, they, um, what the testimonials are from people that have actually attended the course. And uh, one important thing, yes, our courses um, are 950, um, 950 pounds, but um, that was obviously for in-person and we really wanna encourage people to join our course online. Um, and so we're offering you a special workshop offer for today. Um, I mean, the, the, the offer will be valid for a week, um, but you can use this code, which gives you 25% off. Um, and to secure your place, you only need to pay a £250 deposit minus 25%, um, which you can do online and which will be mentioned again at the end. And finally, just before we go into it, I just want to introduce our three teachers. So Stratus, Felicis, 
Um, he has been a UX design lead at Condé Nast, it still is, um, and Kane Simmons, who's um, host and speaker at VUX World and runs his own um, conversational de design agency. Kane, I don't know if I say that correctly, but I'm sure you can correct me later. <laughs> yeah, <that's about laughs> correct everyone else. Um, and then Christina, um, who is a voice and visual designer at Voxy Digital, which is another very well-known um, voice agency in London. So that's, so that's it for me, and I want to hand over to Kane, and thank you for your time. Um, and if you have any questions, please leave them on the um, live comments. We will be answering all questions um, as we get through the presentation. Cool. Thank you, Naveed. And uh, yeah, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And uh, so the first thing, really, that uh, we want to kind of do, so during the course of this sort of webinar, what we'll do is, We'll set some scene, give you some context in terms of what conversation design is for those of you that are, are not familiar. Whenever I say that to people that are design conversations, usually the question is, what the hell does that mean? What does that mean? Uh, so we're going to kind of start really broad and we're going to discuss a little bit about what a conversa conversation design is, what that entails. But then we're going to have a little bit of a look at the various ways and, and types of interfaces that conversation designers create. Uh, we're going to have a look at um, the, the architecture of a typical conversational system. You know, we're going to, we're going to use a voice uh, assistant as an example, essentially, to give you an overview of where in that kind of tech stack, if you like, or where within uh, the scope of the technology does a conversation designer play and hopefully that might teach you a thing or two as well about how something like alexa actually works uh, which you need to know if you're going to be a conversation designer for the voice platforms um, and then christine is going to take us through uh, some really helpful examples some hands-on examples of uh, case studies and tips that you can use to to kind of take into consideration if you want to kind of be a conversation designer and then we're going to wrap up with a little bit of like further reading and places that you can go to find out a little bit more and naveed will wrap up a little bit with uh, with a little bit more about the course as well so what is a conversation designer basically that's the, that's the first question what is conversation design and if you think about uh, all of the interactions that we have with technology these days we've got touch-based interactions we've got screens we have now the advent of voice interactions and conversation design is essentially creating an interaction between a usually an automated bot and a user that uses natural language as the basis for communication. And so you'll know that the slide that you just had a preview to there, um, lots of conversation design is visual only. And, and so it's it's kind of like, you've probably seen Facebook Messenger bots, chat bots, things like that. If you use Google Assistant on your mobile, that's, that's a visual uh, kind of experience. And so it involves uh, dialogue design, uh, which we'll come on to a little bit more uh, in a moment, and, and, and crafting conversations that have a predominantly visual first um, modality. But also, if you if we kind of move slightly further ahead, one of the kind of big areas of interest, which is the sort of genesis for this course, and and maybe some of the, the reason for you is kind of tuning in today, is the concept of VUI design, as it's pronounced, or voice user interface design, which is a subset of conversation design and deals with, in particular, the creation of conversations that are designed to be spoken. And those kind of spoken conversations come in a variety of forms so you're probably familiar with your likes of Amazon Alexa and the smart speakers and the, those are kind of like voice only interfaces uh, and it's not just the uh, the echoes and, and things like that we're seeing more and more voice first interfaces come up and you'll see more and more things like IVR phone systems and stuff like that and the fundamental principles of designing conversations apply no matter what device or platform you're designing for uh, so there's voice only and we also have uh, we have uh, sorry, uh, voice forward. And voice forward is where voice is still the leading driver of the conversation, but you can also kind of tap and click the interface. So if, if any of you have the uh, Google Home Hub or the Nest Hub, as it's now called, or if you have the uh, Amazon Echo Show, uh, even, even uh, Android devices potentially can be classed as voice forward, but more often than not, it's, it's smart displays is what we're referring to. It's things where the conversation, the vocal conversation is the primary interface interface and the screen is there as a secondary interface either to supplement the conversation and to add additional information or to provide sometimes a, a quicker way of just tapping on something to get further ahead uh, and, to, and to progress and then we have the concept of intermodal 
interactions. Uh, and that is more where you're combining modalities. And when we say modalities, really, it's just either an input or an output. And so you will you might look at um, the Siri on the screen there, but but uh, and you can kind of tap various bits. If you talk, if talk to Siri, if you say set an alarm for seven o'clock, it'll bring that up and you can tap to turn it off. If you use Google Assistant on your mobile, you can start the interaction with a conversation, but then you can type the interaction afterwards. And so that's the concept of intermodal. And so if you look at it on a spectrum of where a conversation designer's role is and, and the kind of interactions you're going to be that designing for the kind of interfaces, it starts over on one end with voice only, which is audio only, which is pure speech, spoken speech and received audio. Uh, and then you've got the voice forward, which is where the speech and the conversation still leads the conversation, but you've got an assistant, assistant screen with you. Um, and then you've got intermodal, which is where you can do a combination of, you know, talking, tapping, swiping, clicking. Uh, and then you've also got visual only, which is where the, the everything is just a touch based or a typing based interface. Um, and so I hope that kind of puts into context a little bit of, of the kind of interactions conversation designers create, because it isn't just only the, the actual dialogue. Conversation designers are also involved right the way through this spectrum. So if you want to create a conversation that has a screen, how do you kind of design that interaction? If the interaction is supposed to be both touch-based and vocal-based, speech-based, then that's where a conversation designer uh, needs to work as well. And so <clears throat> if we take a look at uh, the kind of architecture, if you like, and we're going to use a voice uh, platform as the basis. We'll use Alexa because that's what kind of people are mostly familiar with. Um, and it's helpful to try and frame what a conversation designer does if you actually look at how Alexa works because if you're going to work with any voice user interface the tech stack and how it works is going to be largely the same no matter what you're designing for it doesn't matter if it's google assistant doesn't matter if you're creating a bespoke voice interface to go onto your website or into your app or something like that the, the general architecture is the same <clears throat> excuse me and if you can understand the architecture and you can understand what's doing what then you can understand where a conversation designer can affect and the kind of things a conversation designer does and so this is an overview of how Alexa works, but it's also an overview of how any other voice-based platform works or voice-based interface works, is that on the left-hand side, you've got the user making a request and they say something to the system. That, it, that audio is translated into text, and it does that by using something called automatic speech recognition. Uh, before that, there's something called wake word detection, which is the system recognizing that you've said Alexa or whatever it is that you use to invoke the system and to wake it up. Uh, and then the automatic speech recognition takes that audio strips it down into a, a series of individual what they call phonemes, which is essentially the building blocks of speech. So if I was to say k, a, t, those are the phonemes that make up cat. And so speech recognition systems break down audio to those phonemes. And then what they do is they work out the natural language understanding process, which follows the speech recognition, tries to work out based on those phonemes what someone is actually saying. And they translate that audio into text and so ultimately as a uh, the, these these speech systems although they're dealing with audio the vast majority of them end up producing text as a result that text is then uh, glossed over by the natural language understanding unit and what that does is it tries to assign meaning or intent to the system and that's the first term that you'll come across that conversation designers use day in and day out is the word intent so an intent is something that the user is trying to do or a piece of functionality that your system can support so for example if i wanted to book a train ticket then i would be invoking a train ticket booking intent now there's lots of things that happen within that intent in order for me to have a train ticket at the end of the conversation i need to go through some dialogue i need to the system needs to know when where i want to leave from where i want to get to what time i want to go how many people are traveling whether or not the cost that we found is acceptable so there's a lot of to and fro and a lot of dialogue that you need to have in order to be able to gather enough information to fulfill that intent but what happens once the intent has been uh, understood is that your system over there on the right hand side is sent that intent. And so when you create these conversations, you're pretty much starting out with a series of intents that you can fulfill. It might be to book a train ticket. It might be to order a taxi. It could be to cancel a reservation. It could be to add something to an order. It could be to check out an order, find a product. You know, there's a whole series of different intents that you'll create. Um, <clears throat> once your system receives that intent, you then need to work out the logic that is required to, in order to 
fulfill that, which might be spoken word dialogue. It might be some kind of integration with another system to retrieve some data to package up in some dialogue. And so that's another thing to consider when you're designing conversations is that you'll often be working with not just the platform you're designing for, like Alexa or Google Assistant, but you'll also be working with APIs and other systems that, that kind of are required in order for you to get the data needed to fulfill that request. And then the, 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 uh, the information is passed back to Alexa in text form in dialogue, which is another area that a conversation designer will be involved in is creating those responses. And then that response in text form is uh, something called um, text to speech or speech to text. Uh, yes, text to speech, sorry, uh, goes over that dialogue and then translates that into an MP3 file using the synthetic voice and then feeds that back through your system. And so that's the end-to-end -end journey. And if you move forward a little bit and we'll kind of highlight some of the areas where conversation designers have a role. <clears throat> so the first thing is that when a user says something, uh, if you just skip forward one, Adrian, or in fact, skip forward a couple, one, two, three, four, five, actually, um, you'll notice that the, the first thing on the left-hand side is the user making the request. A conversation designer's job is to figure out all of the different ways that someone is likely to say whatever it is that they're likely to say, all right? So that's part of the discovery kind of process, part of the prototyping process is to figure out how will people ask these questions. You don't need to do absolutely everything because the system, the machine learning algorithms can figure some of it out, but you need to have a good understanding of what users are going to say and what a good use case looks like in the first place, which is usually step number one is finding a good use case. Then when, when the uh, the system is uh, in, in the middle there, that central block is, is understanding the intent. So you need to create the intents essentially um, for the system to understand, uh, which happens uh, during the kind of conversation design process. And then you, you'll you devise the responses. So all of the different uh, ways that you're going to uh, respond to, to the various user requests. Part of, of understanding that dialogue and, and what people are saying is to, to come up with a whole load of what's called sample utterances. So you'll create a whole load of examples of what people are likely to say to the system, feed that into that central piece there so that the natural language understanding unit is capable of understanding the variety of things that people say. Uh, and then and then the response coming back is the responses that's what you'll create as well and then also if there is as i mentioned any other graphical kind of interfaces that, that are required any other graphical things like google assistant you can use chips which are like little suggestion chips or facebook messenger you can use like buttons and things like that and so if there is any uh, visual stimulus that is required depending on the type of interaction then a conversation designer is also involved in understanding what those need to be as well and so that's the kind of <clears throat> excuse me the broad overview of, the, of a conversation designer is finding a use case understanding how people are going to speak to the system writing the dialogues that respond based on what users say and working with this with the technologists to understand where you're going to get that data from and how you're going to fulfill that request training the nlu the system in the middle to try and make sure that you can match what someone says with something that you can fulfill right in those responses. Also, maybe a little bit of sound design, depending on the kind of application, and then also any supporting graphical, um, in, uh, you know, graphical modalities that might be needed to supplement the interaction. And then, in terms of the kind of skill sets that, that are useful for for conversation designers, I've I've worked with and during the the VUX World podcast, which we've been doing for the past two and a half years, we've spoke to countless conversation designers essentially and they all come from a whole lot of different walks of life Naveed mentioned at the beginning that you know the, the the UX Academy voice course isn't just for UX designers it's for a whole range of different people and the reason for that is because there's a whole range of different skill sets that can play a real key role in designing conversations <clears throat> user experience design is one of them if you're familiar with user experience design, if you're already a user experience designer, then you'll already have that fundamental understanding of the process that you go through, the creative process that you go through from nothing to identifying a use case, to prototyping, to testing, to iterating, to then making something live. Uh, and you'll have a, an understanding of the general methodology. Um, <clears throat> user research is valuable. You know, I mentioned that one of the most important things that you need to do is find a good use case that involves speaking to people, speaking to users, speaking to customers, figuring out what their problems are, what their pain points are, and seeing whether or not a conversational solution will fix that. Writing is a real core skill set, as you can imagine. And th this is what people, most people think is the, is the main skill set is writing, but there's a whole load, load of other skills that kind of surround it. Um, <clears throat> so if, you, if you're a UX writer, if you're an author, if you're a creative writer, if you're a screenplay writer, I've met many people who, who've written screenplays and, and uh, you know, dramas and things like that, TV shows. 
who make really good conversation designers because there's a difference between designing for something to be read and spoken versus designing for something to be read kind of in your head. Um, and so and so writing is a core skill set. Sound design is not a core skill necessarily. But it's an important one because even though we're designing dialogue, dialogue is still audio and there needs to be a certain amount of crafting of that audio. And so there's something called SSML, which allows you to change how the system pronounces certain things, allows you to adjust the kind of uh, pitch and, and all this kind of stuff. And so really, you need to treat the voice like an instrument. And as well, you can use all kinds of other uh, sound uh, bites and, and ear cons and you know, audio, sonic brand and stuff like that to create a really immersive experience. So having an understanding of sound design really helps. You need to have some degree of technical understanding, which can be taught. It doesn't need to be kind of, you don't need to have that initially, but understanding how the current systems that your business operates within work and the kind of information that those systems need to be fed in order for them to fulfill a transaction. Uh, so having a broad technical understanding helps. It also helps translating your designs into something that can be understood by, by the person who's going to build it. Psychology is a useful uh, skill to have as well, understanding human psychology, because you're creating human interactions uh, and the, the spoken word is fundamental to human nature. You know, babies can recognize their mother's voice before they're even born. And so we have mate kind of hard wiring you're acutely attuned to speech that the way you phrase something the way something's said you know if i was to say the way that i respond to a sentence you'll be able to tell my mood you'll be able to just by hearing my voice you can hear you know if i'm male or female you know how roughly how old i am whether i'm excited or if i'm sad there's so much information contained within the human voice that having an understanding of how people perceive voices and, and, and speeches is really important because it means you, you can design with that in mind to create really delightful experiences and then visual design as a supplementary skill set because if you are creating uh, interactions that do require a multimodal kind of approach, then having an understanding of, of what visual representations would look uh, and work really well for the interaction is important as well. And uh, I think that's kind of pretty much it for, for my side. I'll, I'll kind of hand over to Christina, who will give you a run through of, of some of the case studies that she's been working on and, and give you a few kind of insights into some of the other you know tips and insights that you'd be finding useful when it comes to uh, designing conversations. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, Kane. Um, yeah. So let, let's take a look at how we put this all into um, into practice. Um, Any minute now. I'm assuming I'm still there. Yes, you you are still there. I don't mind. You can stay. <laughs> Okay, so um, just to put this um, into into context, uh, the the Match of the Day magazine is the uh, best-selling football, sports, and and sports gaming magazine in the UK. Um, it comes out every Tuesday, and they have a highly um, engaged audience and highly engaged um, readership. And in this project, we work with their brand ambassadors, Paz and Catch, who um, feature throughout the magazine, the website, and their um, and their social media channels. So in this, um, um, in addition to their to their print and, and and digital content, they wanted to create new ways to to connect with their audience and to keep them engaged um, throughout the week and deliver footy content in a more more user led way. So our solution was to create the ultimate um, voice trivia game for for footy fans. And the game is available on uh, Alexa and Google Assistant enabled devices, so you can you can play them on on your um, uh, smart speaker, on your TV, but most importantly on your on your mobile as well. Um, the core element of the of the voice um, experience is is a weekly quiz, a trivia that consists of um, five multiple choice questions. Now we know that um, trivia. Um, Works. It's it's one of the best performing categories in um, in the skill store, and it offers us a solid um, a solid and, and proven use case. And it also like, successfully channels the the entertainment and the competitive spirits of um, of of a sport game. So it seemed to be like a very uh, very good match for the resources um, and and the objectives of the of the match of the uh, match of the day team. Um, the the skill comes with an online leaderboard. So when you, um, you, you can play the quiz at, um, at two levels. 
Um, if you want to play an easier easier uh, game, then you can you can go for the um, for the Sunday league. If you want uh, more difficult questions, then you can go and play on the um, on the pro league. Um, and because this is a quiz, you can play the quiz once um, once every week before the new content um, um, is released. But during the uh, but during the week, you can play in training mode as well. And then when you play the quiz, um, you sc you score. Uh, points for your team and you can track your team's performance on this online leaderboard so you go online it's on the match of the day um, magazine's website you can track how your team uh, how your team is doing throughout the season um, and you can also track uh, track the previous week's results we've also included a couple of how-to guides and uh, and instructions on how to how to play the game on on the on the different devices um, the the leaderboard is uh, available in the in the voice app as well, although the the experience is slightly different. Um, in case of a voice only experience, you hear your team's result um, at the end of the quiz. If you are playing on a screen based device, then we can we can share more information with the users. So so you'll be able to see um, a, a group of five teams and and their results. Um, on on the screen, uh, we've also created a bespoke uh, content management system for the match of the day uh, magazines team to um, to manage the uh, the question banks and um, and program the the the, the quiz basically. Now the the brand is. The brand is really, really dynamic and uh, and and colourful, and it's a it's a fun loving, fun loving brand. We're quite geeky about football and gaming, so our challenge was to bring this this spirit into a voice platform, and and very often a voice only platform. Um, so we decided to use um, a mix of uh, synthetic and uh, synthetic um, language and. Uh, yeah, thank you. So a synthetic voice and um, and custom voice. Uh, Paz and Catch have um, recorded hundreds and hundreds of lines for us, which are played throughout the voice experience. And then the voice assistants are the, the quiz masters, and then they answer the, they read out the quizzes, um, the questions. Um, we also use, uh, uses the, the entire language in the skill is um, is centered around, around football. So as you because it, as, as I mentioned, we have a Sunday league and pro league to choose between easy and, and hard levels. Um, and we use phrases like get in, um, you've got it right, or, or that's off target if the answer was not correct. Um, uh, as Keen mentioned, sound effects are super important and they're, they're really powerful um, in uh, to, to create and channel the um, the experience of, of a football stadium in, in, in this case. Um, we, are, we are using the um, Match of the Day magazine's tune right at the first, um, right at the beginning. So that's the first thing that people hear when they when they open the skill. Um, and um, a, a referee whistle, for example, it marks the, uh, the beginning and the end of the quiz. And then you can hear a cheering crowd or a slightly unhappy crowd, depending on whether you answer um, correctly or, or incorrectly. And the brand, um, the brand, can, can you just go back one slide? Thank you. So the brand itself, um, visually, is, is very, very dynamic and very, um, very bright. They use uh, bright colors, con uh, contrasting colors, and geometric shapes and fonts. We wanted to recreate that in the skill, so we wanted to create um, a lot of movements on, on the screen as well. So when you open the uh, when you open the skill, then you, you can see the heads um, uh, bouncing, uh, wobbling on the screen to the rhythm of the music. And, and as you answer the question, you actually um, kick the ball to the goal. And then if you answer correctly, then the goalkeeper jumps in, in the opposite direction or in a different direction. And then the goal and your, the ball goes into the uh, into goal and then you score a point. If your answer is incorrect, then the goalkeeper will catch the ball. Designing for children um, poses uh, specific challenges. Um, 
first because it's quite difficult for for the voice assistant to understand um a, a child's speech so this is where uh, where the uh, robust and error handling really comes into play and it's really important that you you prepare for the unexpected you prepare for um for everything and and basically um have the have the player get through the experience without um, getting ripped out of the skill or getting stuck in in a conversation in an endless conversational loop um, kids also need a lot of feedback and encouragement, so um, sound effects and animation play an important role in um, helping the kids understand what is happening, but also to, to illustrate the experience and to, to, to elevate the experience. Um, depending on your audience, um, uh, the development level of the kids can be um, can be very different as well, and this might um, and this will have implications on the on the length of the of the answers or the length of the copy that you can um, you can produce or the words that you can use. Um, some of the kids are also more shy and, and sensitive, so they can get uh, discouraged very very quickly and very easily. Um, which is which can be um, uh, very challenging if you're working in a, if if you're using or building a trivia skill where sometimes you know you have to deliver bad news when the answers are incorrect. the The third type of challenge that I want to mention is 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 a challenge basically for the whole industry. We are all working hard to um, to try and crack uh, the discoverability. Um, of of the scale. So, how do we um, make sure that people find the 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 voice app or the skill, um, and they they can find out how they can use the skill? Um, and it is challenging because there are over um, over hundred thousand Alexa skills in the skill um, in the skill store, and um, and mo most people are still using the the so called fir first party apps that are provided by. Uh, by the big players uh, to, to play music or to answer questions, to get the weather, get the train times, etc. So what, what we can do, or what we did in this case, I mean their their online and printed platform were like of the obvious first choice to uh, to get the word out. Um, but they're also very active on um, on social media on Facebook, Twitter um, and Instagram. Uh, they posted uh, the articles on the on the news feed in the Instagram stories, and then they they pinned the Instagram story in their uh, in their highlights, so they covered every corner there. Um, and the best thing, or the, the most affecting most effective thing uh, that you can do, and they did, was to to reach out to to their audience, uh, to their community, and their their influencers. Um, and uh, they got to play with a couple of, uh, they got the, well, some of their, their uh, key players to play around with the skill. Uh, can you go on to the next slide? Yeah, so in, in the first case, we, they got, um, they got Donovan, who is a who is a YouTuber, a very popular YouTuber with over like five thousand um, followers, and then they they filmed himself playing around with the skill, um, and then Tottenham player Jack Rose um, also created a video, and of course uh, Catch play uh, played around the demo the skill, um, and uh, he was talking to himself in the skill, so that's that's quite a funny video. Okay, so just to summarize everything, um, as Kane mentioned uh, uh, a couple of times uh, during this training, um, it, it's very important to identify the use case um, and find find out where and how voice can enhance the brand brand experience. You don't have to take a mobile app or a service and try to just shove it into into a voice platform. Find out where it makes uh, more sense to use this um, this platform. Um, and then do spend time to uh, to craft the experience and and make the personality uh, come alive in the skill, because um, there is a growing appetite for well produced and and high quality skills now. And last but not least, make sure you get the word out and and let people know that your skill exists. And I think that was that was the end end of my presentation. I'll hand it back over to Kay. Hello. 
Uh, yes, thank you. Cheers, for Christina. I just wanted to wrap up uh, this this section really just with um, just some resources. Um, people are always kind of asking, where can we go to, uh, to learn more? I mean, one thing is you can join this course first and foremost. Uh, but some people like to do a bit of bedtime reading and all that kind of stuff. And, and some of the kind of other places you can go to to find, uh, you know, some real grounding in this kind of area is one is, is designing voice user interfaces. Uh, that's Kathy Pearl's book on the left hand side there. And I'm sure that these links can be kind of included uh, in the show notes afterwards. Um, but that, that, that book is really a, a really good kind of introduction. In fact, it's fairly detailed, to be honest, of how to design voice user interfaces. Um, it draws on a lot of stuff from the pre-Google and pre-Alexa days. So some of the stuff in the course is, is a lot more contemporary, about a bit more up to date. But this is kind of the, the traditional kind of VUI design um, theory is kind of in there. The next one is from James Jangola. That's a voice user interface design. That is an older book from like 2004 that takes a lot of its learnings from the IVR space. Um, but it's still a really good, uh, a really good view into some of the core principles. This conversation, uh, conversational UX design here by Bob Moore. He's at IBM, and they did a lot of research into conversational structure. And uh, essentially, that's just a reference book. It's not really a book that will teach you a whole lot. It's a book that will have uh, a lot of references to go to. So if you're designing the conversation, you get stuck at a particular point, you can use that as a, as a bit of a reference guide. And this other one isn't a conversation design book, Wired for Speech by Scott Brave and Clifford Nass. That is essentially just, uh, I mentioned earlier on about how our brains are wired for speech. And that's where I got that quote from uh, because it looks into the psychology of the human brain and how uh, you know how speech and how fundamental speech is to being human and why it's so important to create more natural sounding uh, relationships and, and interactions when it comes to creating voice uh, voice user interfaces so those are the four books I would definitely recommend um, if you if you're looking for some bedtime reading essentially and then a couple of other resources uh, obviously the VUX world podcast you can check We've got tons and tons of uh, audio content there that's delving into strategy design and, and voice principles. That's a guy called Ben Sauer who has put that together. He's a really kind of uh, well-renowned design designer and design thinker. He's got a, lo a lot of links to a whole lot of different conversation design resources there. Uh, design guidelines with Google. That's Google's official guidance on conversation conversation design. And the one below it is Amazon's official guidance on their kind of conversation design. This is more specific to those platforms and rather than general conversation design practices uh, but it's worth checking out i think that's about it great well um i just would like to say thank you christina and kane for um those very useful sections this is uh yeah sorry yeah this is uh some of the ah is christina still there yeah Ah, agents here. Yeah, Christina's still there. Yeah, Kane is still there. We're I'm still rolling? Here. Yeah, well, we're still rolling. Cool. So what we're going to do is we're going to go cool. into the Q&A shortly. Um, just yep. before we wrap up, I just wanted to um, come back into the, the stream and just talk about um, the, the conversational design course that you heard from the beginning. So uh, just to let you know, guys, these are some of the tools that we actually use in the course. Um, some people were asking how were we going to deliver this course remotely and tools such as Slack, communication, Google Drive for uh, file collaboration file collaboration, Zoom for video conferencing and breakout rooms. You also have voice flow um, for obviously designing voice interactions, etc. cetera. Miro for, for whiteboarding and then Envision for prototyping. So um, when we bring all of these tools together, um, it's enabling us to be able to deliver the course remotely. And since March, we have been delivering, delivering some of our UX courses online. Yeah, so I just thought I'll just mention that and then yeah, we're just going to go into a real world, uh, a real world uh, project example of, uh, of of conversational design projects that you may um, look to work on if you were to sign up for a course. Of example, as you can see here, um, this is a um, brief assigned by Starling Bank. Um, so in this particular project, uh, the group had six weeks to design a hypothetical skill uh, for starting back. And then they had to follow an end-to-end -end design process. And at the end of the course, um, they, were, they had to be able to deliver 
uh, design artifacts for Amazon certification, prototyping of core parts of the experience in Invocable, which is also a uh, software you can use to be able to develop voice interactions. And then at the end, the, the group studying also had to develop deliver a presentation of the case study at the end. Um, so it's a very practical course. And obviously target devices, um, Alexa, as Kane has mentioned uh, during this during the um, the live stream. And the, of course, the design artifacts for Amazon certification are the VUI flows and the list of sample utterances and slot synonyms. So um, when you look at the project case study presentation, um, you, you'll be looking at things like the problem you're trying to solve, your hypothesis, your design process, uh, insights from the research. Also, be, you'll be looking at things like proof of iteration, demo of latest prototype of core parts of the experience and the next steps and recommendations. I know you guys are hearing all of these things and you're thinking, what is this guy saying? Um, that's, that's probably one of the reasons why um, if you, Come into the course, for example, um, we'll, we'll happily unwrap all of this for you and you get a better understanding of what all of this would mean as you get deeper into the uh, the course. Um, I don't know if Kane or Christina wanted to add to, um, to, to this real, real world project example. No? Okay, cool. Okay, so. Sorry, I was a bit, I was a bit delayed there. No, 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 I think, I think, I think that's, a good, uh, that's a good wrap up. Brilliant, yeah. okay. Great. So we're just going to move on to the next section. So finally, um, this is one of the, the, the sections you guys have all been waiting for is the Q&A. Um, so um, I would like to open up the floor to everyone um, who's listening, who's watching us to submit their questions. For those of you that have submitted your questions already, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to go through them. But for those of you that haven't submitted your questions, please get your questions in so we can get through them. Um, so the first question that we're going to get into is from Nisha T and, and, and he or she is asking is what is the best way to prepare a voice UX design portfolio? Is there any guidelines similar to traditional UX design? Also any references on these? So I don't know if Christina or Kane wants to take this one. Did you create think... a portfolio, Christina? Um, yes, yeah, some of some uh, I, I do have some some of the case studies, um, but it's not like a full full learned portfolio. Um, I mean the the principles behind design creating a voice UX portfolio I think is is very similar to the to the um traditional UX portfolio. So um, I think try and understand um a, a problem and and offer a solution for that. Um. The additional thing that you could you could maybe add to that is how why voice was a good solution for that, or how delivering that solution on a voice enabled platform is different from delivering it on on a visual like a web design a web platform or a mobile platform. I would also add one uh, one other thing, which would be if you can, um, and I know it's difficult given that portfolios tend to be uh, you know sent. In, in a PDF kind of form, but a lot of people have websites with portfolios on it. So if you can include any kind of audio snippets or even links to things that are published that you've designed, then that's always a good idea because what you'll realize very quickly as soon as you start designing voice user interfaces is that what looks good on paper as a sentence doesn't sound the same when it comes out of the speaker mm -hmm. with, a, with a synthetic voice in it and all that kind of stuff. And so what we tend to do whenever we work on any projects is that part of the review uh, of, of, you know, when we go through the phases of, of various projects is that we don't show scripts and we don't show anything visual. We only show and, and test audio with clients. And that's the best way to give people the actual reality of what you've created. And so if you can link to anything that you've created, any audio, uh, any skills that you've done, or even just grab the audio MP3s and embed them onto a website if you're using a website as a portfolio, just to give people a flavor for what it actually sounds like, what you've created. Brilliant. Um, so was there anything else you wanted to add to that question? Just to remind the audience of the question that is on the screen. Great, cool. We're going to move on to the next question. So uh, the next question I have is from Lily Anna to join. Uh, do please forgive me if I pronounce this wrong. And she is asking or he is, he is asking how to make sure or yeah, how to make sure the voice slash copy 
we insert in each medium, example chatbot, a line bracket sound like the brand itself and not us. That's the copy creator. I don't know if that made any sense to you, Christina and Kane. Um, I don't know if you guys can make head or toe of that, but I'm going to try and decipher this. So how to make sure the voice we insert in each medium, for example, chatbot aligns or sounds like the brand itself and not us, the copy creator. Um, I don't know if that made sense to you, Christina or Kane. Yeah, yeah, it did. Yeah. I mean, I think this is this is definitely a craft that you learn um, through life, basically. But for every single project, it's very important that you that you familiar familiarize yourself with the um, with the tone of a tone of voice of the brand and um, and help them um, help them understand what how that sort of to that tone uh, can be can be used in in a voice um, or a chatbot conversation because most of the um, most of the organizations already have their their brand um, guidelines and very extensive and, and I'm talking about hundreds and hundreds of pages of uh, brand guidelines and documentations but they are not not really for this platform so you will have to sort of con condense and interpret that material into um, for, for this context as well but you can definitely learn it. I mean, if I can be completely honest, the football lingo isn't isn't my forte. Um, but we work closely with the client um, to to make sure that what they have to say comes naturally to us because it is their voice. So we we highlighted certain sections where we wanted to to really sound like them, and then we we involve them into the content creation process. Hmm. I'll, I'll just add one one thing to that, which would be that um, during the co during the creative kind of process, we we typically and I'm, this is in the course as well, is that you'll actually work on a persona for the brand. And so this is when I was getting at earlier on in terms of some of the skills that are useful to have is the writing skill and, and people coming from screenplay writing and stuff like that is because those people know how to create characters and that's exactly what you do when you're creating a character. Now the character needs to be representative of the brand nine times out of ten. Although there is cases where actually the persona that you would design for might actually be the same persona as the bot itself. So it might be that you're trying to piggyback on a level. So it might be you're taking the brand persona and trying to personify that. And what you would produce at the end of that would be a uh, tone, of, tone of voice guidelines, essentially, which is essentially the same as brand guidelines that stipulate how this thing should talk with some sample dialogues in there as well. And so there's, there's tools and a process to craft that voice and to make sure that even if there's a bunch of designers working on the same project, they're all adhering to the same kind of guidelines. Brilliant. Awesome. Thank you, Kane and Christina. We're going to move on to the next question. Uh, the next question I have is for Kane. Um, he must be uh, quite popular here. Um, so this is from Alistair Cook. Uh, he's saying, what considerations should be made when designing VUI for healthcare? And do you have any good examples of VUI in healthcare? Nice and simple. I want to leave it to you, yeah. Kane. Fair dues. Cheers. Uh, so considerations, it, it kind of depends on who you're designing for. Um, so whether you're designing something to be used by an end user, a potential patient, or if you're designing something to be used internally within the medical environment, like a, a surgeon or a clinician or something like that, that's using the technology to be more productive. In the former, if you're designing for end users, the considerations you need to consider ultimately is what use cases are you actually going to service in those environments? And then secondly, how are you going to do that? So for example, if, you, if you're trying to service a use case, which, which is a diagnosis, then you might want to kind of think about whether or not you are able to provide a secure environment and a trusted environment for people to want to provide the kind of information that you need to provide some kind of diagnosis. The second thing is how are you going to do that, which is that are you going to try and do that on Alexa or are you going to try and do that in your own proprietary channel where you create your own technology stack to be able to do that in a more kind of secure sort of way. So those two are things to consider. Uh, other things to consider is whether or not you... Um, you know whether whether you try and uh, rather than the the intense use cases because the, the thing is, is is that you need to kind of build trust nine times out of ten. Now there's some research out there which is that people feel more comfortable talking to a bot than they do a human, and therefore they're more likely to share and perhaps overshare sometimes. Um, but it's all to do with basically trying to figure out what what the use case is and whether uh, and whether or not you can do that in a safe and secure way. Because privacy is by far and away, even for people who own smart kind of 
devices is by far and away the kind of main thing that's on people's minds at the moment. Uh, and then good examples, if you, you should check out the Mayo Clinic, they're doing some really interesting stuff. A lot of it's kind of internal, helping them operate more efficiently. And Babylon Health are doing some really interesting stuff as well, which is not, they haven't ventured into the voice realm yet. They're, they're doing more kind of conversational kind of chatbot based things. And I don't think they get into the point of diagnosis, um, but they're doing some really interesting stuff. Uh, and also, if you're interested, check out uh, something called Canary Speech. What they can do is with three minutes worth of audio, they can diagnose Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, uh, stress, anxiety, a whole range of other stuff. There's apparently two and a half thousand data points in a, in a voice snippet of audio. Uh, and so, yeah, there's, there's some really interesting stuff going on, but it's whether or not users trust it and are comfortable enough right now to, to do the kind of use cases that would really start saving clinic clinicians uh, some real time. Awesome. Uh, thanks for that, Kane. Um, we have another question here. I can see a lot of questions are coming into the chat box. Um, we're we're going to try and get through as many as we can. Um, but obviously, due to time, we may not be able to cover all of them. Um, just to add to Babylon Health, um, for those of you who um, follow Mobile UX London, um, we did a meetup with Babylon Health. So if you go through the YouTube channel, uh, you should be able to see some content from the previous meetup on that app. Okay, um, the next question I have, Kane, is what are the most frequent cases of Midas Touch in conversation design? Midas Touch, is that the, I just have to Google what that was. That's basically the kind of like uh, the fella that everything he touches turns to gold. Is that right? <laughs> um, wouldn't have a clue, actually. <laughs> I think it is. I will we'll use that as an example. The the, the, the solid gold use cases. Uh, I would say mu music is by far and away uh, the the most popular use case for voice uh it's it's still requires conversation design because you still need to have an intent that you need to recognize and a whole bunch of different types of utterances that you need to listen out for um and so audio uh, audio playback is is uh the mildest touch that, in my opinion i think christina's probably got some different thoughts around games and, and interactive entertainment and stuff like that i would imagine um yeah i mean this this to me, I mean, I, I did have to Google it as well. But to me, what what's, uh, what sprang to mind was the um, was the monetization of skill of skills, which is obviously very um, very relevant for games as well. And and um, Amazon is is doing um, a great job on expanding on this space and enabling game creators to. Um, to, to monetize their their skills either through subscriptions or buying some um you know extra lives or extra equipment for the games and and stuff like that brilliant okay um so we'll move on quickly to the next question i have here um so okay so i've got a question here from sam and he asks, uh, recently I've had to deal with a family member suffering an illness which affects speech, that's stroke. How can VUI help with improving the experience for the user? Any good examples of this in practice? Uh, mm -hmm. Kane, maybe you can quickly answer this one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, check out Voiceit, uh, V-O-I-C-E-I-T-T. Uh, it's a technology that, that is specifically for people who have uh, have had a stroke and, and things like that. And essentially, all it is, is it's a app. You can use the technology in different ways as well if you wanted to use it yourself to build your own stuff. But essentially, it's an app. You train it based on how you speak now, post-stroke, so to speak. And then what it does is it then learns how you speak, and it can translate what you speak into text that can be spoken out loud by a synthetic voice. And then you can you know, you know can have the dialogue kind of that way. So definitely check out Voice It is a is a unbelievable technology cool great uh so let's just move on to the next one quickly um okay and valerie Celia asks any reason adobe xd is not listed as one of the tools used so um i'll quickly start off by answering that and probably the teachers can finish that off um so um usually with uh, our courses um we tend to have our go-to tools that we use valerie but in terms of bringing in other tools that you may want to use um, for the course, for example, um, that's something we usually welcome, um, but that may change, you know, from time to time based on, you know, what's happening in the market. You know, sorry, let me say that again. Based on what's happening in the in the in the market or what what the current demands or the requirements of the course is, um, is, is that right, Kane and Christina? Yeah, I would say that the the reason why I would want to use a different tool for the purposes of this course in particular is because 
Uh, Adobe XD, although so Adobe acquired a company called Sayspring, which was a voice prototyping tool, and then they've integrated that technology into XD. And so it's really good. It is cool. Um, but it tends to lean you more towards design and visual first, and then you thread together the visuals with the voice interaction. Whereas what we're trying to teach in this course is the fundamental principles of conversation design, interactions that you can have without a screen in a voice first environment that then you can supplement and enhance with the screen so we're, we're, we're creating voice first as opposed to screen first adobe xd is a fantastic tool and i use adobe xd myself especially if we're doing more kind of interactive touch-based things that require a voice interface but usually what we prefer to do is to train and teach how to create conversations so that then you know what a good interaction looks like and how to create one so then you can then apply that to the visual side of things rather than working the other way around thank you kane uh, thanks so much um, we had another question, which was very similar. So um, we're probably going to skip that. Um, next question I have is from um, Raman Deep. And he asked how UX designers should start work on voice. Um, I think that I think that makes sense to you, does it? <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I think yeah. he's probably asking yeah, yeah. How, how can a UX designer get into voice, perhaps? Yeah. How did you How did you get started, Christina? You were in the UX beforehand, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. So I started... Um, I started off by uh, by doing a, a, a training and, and and the bootcamp to be honest, um, and then um, there are a lot of resources on on Amazon and, and and Google's website as well where you can um, when you can um, learn and like uh, learn um, the the basic design principles, um, and then there are a lot of ways to sort of. Um, put this all into into practice and voice flow is a fantastic tool if you want to just sort of like demonstrate your experience uh um describe describe a problem find a solution for that and then you can put it in in, in your case study brilliant thank you guys um move on quickly um it's running out of time and um, we have another question from gofam gunasekaran and he is asking should i learn ux content writing if I want to get into VUX, I don't know. Maybe you could handle that, Kate. Yeah, um, it's it's a core it's a core competency writing. The the only differences between VUX writing versus content writing is that, as I mentioned earlier on, writing to, for things to be spoken is different for writing to be things to be read so if you were to pick up a harry potter book go to any page read the page have a look at what's what's said and then watch the film you will notice that the dialogue is totally different because when people are talking to each other the the way that you speak the, the you know people tend to speak in fairly long sentences you know the, the, you don't speak with grammar and stuff like that and so I would definitely encourage anyone to learn more about any kind of writing because it's a core competency of, of creating conversational experiences. But as well as using UX content writing, I'd also look into trying to research things like screenplay writing. Go to the BBC Writers Room. They publish a load of scripts that they use in dramas and sitcoms and comedies and stuff like that. That'll start to train you in how sentences and dialogues go for when you're writing for screen. Um, and then the other thing I would say is that even though there's UX content writers now who are really good at writing really good content, in future, the website content is going to need to be more conversational as well. If you look at the direction Google is going, it's essentially serving web spoken results that are scraped from web pages for 90% of its of its uh, results that come through audibly. And so what we're trying to do is get clients to start writing their content in more of a conversational manner. And so this kind of conversational design language, I think, is going to start creeping into UX writing as well. So definitely learn all you can about writing any kind of uh, any kind of stuff, but pay attention to how dialogue is written. Awesome. Thank you, Kane. Uh, just going to get through a couple of questions and we can start to wrap up. Um, we have another question from Atika and she asks, when it comes to a conversation, we can't exactly predict how users are going to answer. Hence, we need to prepare multiple scenarios. How far do you map the possibility of the conversation? Maybe you can take that, Kane. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll 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 have a stab, and then I'm sure Christina might have some. some other <laughs> uh, so, so essentially, all you need to all you're doing is you're providing sample utterances, and that is examples of the kind of things that people say. Now, we tend to overdo that a little bit because we want to make sure that we can capture as many different things as as possible. But the the whole point in the AI is that it will understand based on the samples that you provide it how to match against other things that people say. So as I mentioned, if I provide a sample utterance which is something like "set my alarm for 9 a.m.", and I provide that to Alexa, and but the user actually says create a wake up for me at 9am 
then providing I give it enough sample data to let Alexa know that what I'm saying is I want someone to book to set an alarm, then even if what they say is slightly different to what I provided, the AI in, in the middle will figure that out and it should still kind of work. In terms of the actual conversation mapping and how many different directions you want to go in and all that kind of stuff, really you need to be thinking about what the purpose of the application is and whether or not those different directions and trees and, and all that kind of stuff are going to help the user get to what they want or whether they're going to hinder the user from getting to what they want. And so there's ways that you can frame things and bring people back on course if they start to veer off track. You can have Easter eggs in there and do it subtly and nicely, but ultimately the, the thing exists for a purpose. And so anything that takes the user away from that purpose, you need to kind of design to get them back on track. I don't know whether you've got any other thoughts on that, Christina. Yeah, yeah, just one, one, one small, small thing is that I mean, the trick in the trick in here is that you have to uh, to to formulate the question in the first place that solicits the kind of answer that the system is the system is looking for and can't be misinterpreted. So this is where uh, learning the craft comes into comes into place. Awesome, brilliant. Thanks, Christine and Kane. And it looks like we're starting to wrap up towards the end. So we have another question from Jill, and she asks, "How complicated is it to understand?" the user's intent when designing for more than one voice request, i.e. combined or multi-part verbal instructions, questions or tasks, i.e. for Alexa. I don't know who can take that one. How complicated is it to, sorry, sorry for that question again? Yeah, let, let, oh, me, oh. let me repeat that. So yeah, how complicated is it to understand the user's intent when designing for more than one voice request, i.e. combined or multi-part verbal instructions, questions or tasks, i.e. for Alexa. I don't know if that made any I think, sense. I think I think you might be getting at um, if somebody includes a lot of information in the thing that they say, so it's a multi-part verbal instruction. So, for example, if I was to say, book me a train ticket for Friday at 7 p.m., that's kind of multi-part because the, the intent is book the train ticket, but the values that I need to fulfill that request, there's multiple parts of them. So I need to know the time, I need to know the destination, I need to know uh, the the starting point, uh, and et cetera. And so really, if you what Alexa does is you've got the intent at the high level, and then to fulfill that intent, you need to provide what is called slots. Okay, so in, in the book a train ticket intent, there are a number of slots within there that you need to capture. So one is the the time, the other is the date, the other is the starting station. The other is the uh, the destination station. And then you might include things like how many people do you want to uh, book a ticket for, whether or not you have any accessibility needs. And so there's various slots that you need to gather in order to fulfill that one request. And when you're writing dialogue and you're crafting dialogue, you just need to forecast, roughly speaking, how people will ask for those things in different ways. So you might have the question, which is, book me a train ticket for slot value time at slot value day or whatever it might be. So there's loads of different ways that you can kind of handle and, and listen for different values and multi-part kind of uh, in those multi-part sentences. Hope that makes sense. Brilliant. Well, that sounds great to me, Kane. Um, so we're going to get towards the final questions. And now I've got a question from Carol. And Carol asks, can you share some information of using VUI in virtual reality environment? I don't know if that's a bit um, advanced or don't know if you can take that, any one of you. Uh, just I'll just check out Anything World, anything.world, uh, which is a company that are creating, uh, essentially it's built on Unity. And what they do is they have a, a voice user interface where you can ask for anything and it will put it into the game, basically. So if you wanted to ask for a monkey driving a taxi, waving a, a mop, then that will appear in the in the system. It's really, really impressive. Uh, they I don't know if they've got to the point where they've got a virtual reality system set up yet, but that's certainly what they were doing. That was the, the, the direction they were traveling in. So check out anything.world and, and uh, yeah, check that out. Brilliant. Awesome. Uh, thanks for that, Kane. And that looks like that's brought us to the end of the Q&A section. I would like to thank Kane and, Chris and Christina for um, taking part of today's webinar. And I hope all of you found that very insightful. Um, just to remind you guys, um, we do have that special offer on the table. So 
if any of you would like to enroll to the course, um, which we starting at the end of May, um, now is your, your chance. Um, everyone's in lockdown and we're running these courses remotely. Uh, there's no better time than, than this. Um, and as I mentioned before, we have courses running remotely already and so there's nothing to worry about um you've seen some of the students from the, the great companies that have come from companies like microsoft so and so forth who have studied with us so um you are in great hands here and we've got fantastic teachers such as kane and christina who you've heard they have shared some great answers for today um so if you guys want to enroll to the conversational design course or some would say voice design course um just visit myuxacademy.com forward slash enroll. Uh, we have a special treat for you guys who have stayed to the end, 25% off the course. Uh, just use the code workshop25 in the cart and that will then give you that special discount. Um, great news is that we do have flexible payment plans as we understand that um, things may not be always economically comfortable for everyone so for those that want to reserve their place you just need to put down a deposit of 250 pounds and then we can then work out some flexible payment plans to uh, bring your uh, course payment up to up to date just after the course starts okay and i think that's gonna be everything um again kane Christina, thank you again for your time. And I'd like to say a big thank you to everyone who has uh, tuned in to the uh, webinar. And there's been a lot of um, demand for this, been a lot of um, interest in this. And I'm glad that everyone from the comments from YouTube and from Facebook, um, that everyone has got a lot of value and found this very interesting. So um, if you do want to learn a lot more from what you've heard today, you know, the course enrollments ends in very soon a few weeks and the course will start on may 27th uh, so please uh visit the link and then obviously enroll and then we can obviously um guide you further in your voice design or your conversational design journey um if you like to get in touch with me you're more than welcome to do so um you can drop me an email uh, adrian at myuxacademy.com and we'll be happy to help you and until then, until next time, uh, we will see you later. Thank you. Bye -bye. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.